on the solemnity of Corpus Christi, a reading from the Epistle of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brethren, for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread and giving thanks, broke and said, Take ye and eat, this is my body, which shall be delivered for you. This do for the commemoration of me. In like manner also the chalice, after he had supped, saying, This chalice is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye, as often as you shall drink, for the commemoration of me. For as often as you shall eat this bread and drink this chalice, you shall show the death of the Lord until he comes. Therefore, whosoever shall eat this bread or drink the chalice of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man prove himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of the chalice. For he shall that eats and drinks unworthily eateth and drinketh judgment to himself, not discerning the body of the Lord. The reading for the Holy Gospel according to St. John. At that time, Jesus said to the multitudes of the Jews, My flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood abideth in me, and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, the same also shall live by me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna, and are dead. He that eateth this bread shall live forever. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. Reverend fathers and brothers, dear friends, we renew our congratulations to the graduates of the school. Yesterday, honored in the commencement ceremonies and in the Holy Mass here in the church. And we congratulate, we renew our congratulations, especially to the teachers, the clergy, and the families with this great achievement of one more academic year, which ends with great success. Today we have the solemnity of Corpus Christi. After Mass today, we shall process outside the church in the procession of the Blessed Sacrament. We invite all of you to, to follow us to attend this solemn procession of our faith to honor the very source of our holy Catholic faith which is the most blessed sacrament, which is the true presence of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, living among us through this most holy sacrament. If the crisis today continues, perhaps with greater momentum, it is because this crisis has engines this crisis has dynamics. This crisis has not only causes, but also principles that keep it moving and progressing. And the chief and most central engine of this horrible crisis is the new mass. It is far from the desire and the attention of a Holy Father, Pope Pius XII, who indeed desired a certain simplification of the Holy Liturgy to make it easier, easier to understand, easier to follow, easier to, to carry out. 
I would be very surprised, as you would be, if what we have today in the new Mass, the new sacraments, the fulfillment of his desire, and on the contrary, far from it. Because the new Mass has so denatured the theology of sacrifice and the words that we have just read, the words that we have just heard, do this in the commemoration of me. Do this. We read in the book Pope Colcrimum by Pope St. Pius V, the famous bull Quo Primum, in which he reminds the entire world that this holy sacrifice of the Mass that we have, and for which each one of you has entered and passed through the doors of this holy place, to be sanctified by this sacrament of the true Mass, the Mass which was made permanent for all eternity in the Council of Trent. And it was the Holy Father, Pope St. Pius V, who said that this, this Mass that we are presently attending is in perfect conformity with those words of our Savior, who on the very first Holy Thursday at the Last Supper, the very first Mass, said, do this, this do ye. And that word, this, this is what is to be done unto the, the birth of the Church and the, the sanctification of the faithful. And so, yes, this, that small word spoken by our Savior, do this. And so the Holy Father reminded the entire world that this Mass is that this do ye. And certainly the original form of the Mass as offered by our Savior, since he was offering it in his own person, has known shortly thereafter certain developments which serve only to strengthen and to confirm his original words, not to change them, not to alter them in the slightest way, not one iota of change. And this is what the Holy Father wanted to tell us, that this holy sacrifice of the Mass is indeed, in its essence, in its very nature, in its very purpose, in its very design, since, indeed, it was authored, created by God himself, is the true Mass, the true Mass, the Mass of the saints, the Mass for which you and I have come to this holy place to offer to Almighty God. What, therefore, is the new Mass? The strange new liturgy, which is non-sacrificial and brief and simplified beyond recognition and improvised, as all the new seven sacraments are. We reject and we refuse to have anything to do with these these new sacraments, these new simplified, abbreviated, improvised sacraments, which are doubtfully the conveyors of sanctifying grace. The Archbishop told us we cannot judge the interior forum, the internal forum of the conscience of the celebrants of these sacraments. We cannot judge the conscience. We cannot judge the intentions and the actions if they lead us to judge the intentions, no, we should not. But the fruits, yes, the fruits are evident because there are none. The abomination of desolation, perhaps, is understood in what we have today in the fruits, the so-called fruits of the new mass and the new sacraments, which are empty, 
and barren. So yes, we embrace wholeheartedly this Mass of which Pope St. Pius V said is indeed the one in the same original Mass offered by our Savior on that very first Holy Thursday, that very first Corpus Christi. And so, dear friends, I offer you three reminders. Three reminders today based upon this knowledge of the truth which we receive in the sanctifying grace conveyed through this most holy sacrament, this blessed sacrament, this true and holy sacrifice of the Mass. The first reminder, the will, the malicious will to equalize the new liturgy and the true and authentic traditional Latin Mass, to make them equals, is absurd. It is a complete absurdity, a theological absurdity, because the one and the other cannot coexist. The true and the false cannot coexist. To say one is extraordinary and one is ordinary, and calling the new the ordinary form, to have two forms of the same holy sacrifice of the Mass, is absurd. It has nothing whatsoever to do with the Uniate Oriental churches whose liturgies are based upon the true Roman rite in their essence, whereby the words of our Savior do this in my commemoration are authentically and fully realized. But this radical departure for the notion of sacrifice this radical departure from the, the strengthening of the faith which we receive in the true and authentic sacraments, this we see to be very doubtfully present in the new liturgy. No man can serve two masters. He will love the one or hate the other. It is the one or the other. And we know it is the true sacrifice of the Mass, which is the true, the Tridentine Mass is the true Mass. And the new Mass has no authority over the traditional Mass. And those of you who pass through these doors of this holy place, as we say, have no concern, no worry about the new Mass having the slightest authority over the traditional Mass. They are not equals, and one is not greater than the other as far as the new Mass being higher and having more authority than the, the traditional Mass. Let us remind ourselves of this great truth. The true Mass has the supreme authority of itself because it contains the words of our Savior, and since it sanctifies our souls and bring us, bring us, us closest to God by its very cause and effect, It is, of itself, a holy principle of unity. Those who sanctify themselves in this true Mass are not in the margin of the Church. On the contrary, those who sanctify their souls through this Mass, this Tridentine Mass, are brought to the very heart of the Church, to the very center of the Church. Those who sanctify their souls to the means of this Holy Mass, are indeed the true Church. You are the Church. And the new Mass has no authority over you, has no power over you. And the new sacraments, the baptism without exorcism, the confirmations of vulgar, ordinary oils, the simplified ordination, the simplified holy matrimony, the simplified blessing of the sick, replacing the extreme unction, the last sacraments, 
received to strengthen us for the separation of body and soul at the end of our lives. Each and every one of these sacraments doubtfully conveys the sanctifying grace of which we are in such desperate need today. Because of the fruits, as the Archbishop told us, because of the fruits which we cannot see. Are they so scarce and so weak as to wonder about the validity of these new sacraments? It is not up to us to judge, but to recognize the truth and to hold fast to the true Mass and the true sacraments, and never to be afraid that anything else would ever have any power or authority over us who embrace these true sacraments. In virtue of this fact, that the traditional Mass has supreme authority and the new Mass has none, those who exercise their authority by the practice of the new sacraments have no authority over us. They have no authority over those who sanctify their souls through the true sacraments. If the authorities of the church wish to exercise their delegation from God through the use of the new sacraments, woe unto them. As our Lord said, call no man father, crying out to the Pharisees sitting in the chair of Moses. You have no right. You have no right to be sitting in that chair and to be arrogating to yourselves the authority that only comes from God. So those who exercise their authority through the use of the new sacraments have no authority, no power over those who sanctify their souls through the true sacraments. Let us never forget this great truth this great consolation. <clears throat> it was in the story of the great St. Joan of Arc, whose feast day was only a week ago, when she was brought in from her prison cell, and she faced her 42 judges, and she said, you are not the church. You are not the church. Be careful who you are judging. It takes more than purple robes and crosiers and mitres to represent the divine authority of Almighty God. And this is what she told the king. Just because you are the son, just because you are the heir, just because you have the blood of the royal lineage does not make you king yet. You must be anointed. God must anoint you the king and make you his delegate, his lieutenant, so that Christ the king may reign. <clears throat> and that the heavenly order, the divine order in heaven, may be the same as the temporal order of the earth, of the world, of society. As we see every day in the Our Father, Sicud in Sheruat in Terra, as it is in heaven, so it be on the earth. And so God, only God, can bring this divine order upon the earth, into this world. And so St. Joan reminded the king, until you do that, I will not call you sire. And so in, in her tribunal, in her judgment, in this, in the room where she was giving her testimony, she said to the clergy, to the bishops, the abbots, the prelates, you are not the church because they do not have the divine mission to be doing what they are doing. And for political reasons, for corrupt reasons, they were putting her on trial to kill not just an 18-year-old girl, but the royalty of Christ the King upon the earth to stop, to stop this for corrupt reasons. 
and today. Today we have this interesting development <clears throat> by which prelates are coming to us saying we need you, the church needs you. Stay as you are. Extending to us the olive branch of peace, a false peace. And we say, which church needs us? Which church? We are the church. Which church needs us? Those who sanctify their souls to the true sacraments, you are indeed the church. And there were many sympathizers, as these men, in the trial of St. Joan of Arc, feeling sorry for her, seeing the injustice, seeing the corruption of justice, seeing the imposture of authority. And yes, they realized, perhaps, they recognized in her her innocence and perhaps her divine mission from God recognizing all these great things in this young girl. And yet, paralyzed by legalism, paralyzed by legalism by which they said, something is just not quite right here with this girl. She might be innocent, but there's something wrong still. Because these men have the authority to be doing what they're doing. And so they recognized superficially, the imposture of authority under the guise of true authority. And yes, all the way, all the way to the stake, they would see her be burned, and they did nothing, nothing. Feeling sorry for her, yes. What did they do? Nothing paralyzed by and blinded by the misunderstanding of true authority, by the misunderstanding, the ignorance of true justice, watching this innocent girl martyred before the entire world. And today we have the same thing happening again. These men who pretend to reach out to us will see us die. They will see they are witnesses and guilty bystanders of the martyrdom of tradition. These men are doing nothing. They should reach out to the 80,000 plus priests who have left the priesthoods in Vatican II. They should reach out to the millions of Catholics who have left the church since Vatican II, scandalized by the new sacraments, scandalized by the new religion, Scandalized by the conciliar church, which is no church at all, but an imposture of church. These men should reach the other way, for we are in the church. We are indeed, as the Archbishop reminded us, in the very heart of the church, through the practice, through the, the worship of God, by the means of these true sacraments, these holy sacraments. So yes, today, we are witnesses of the martyrdom of tradition and those well-wishing, well-wishing and good-willed prelates reaching out to us are serving no purpose whatsoever. And they shall be, as we say, the guilty bystanders of this martyrdom of tradition. When St. Joan of Arc was in her prison cell, men came to see her. And one of her judges disguised himself as a friend, a friend. And from her same country, her same region, Lorraine. I am from Lorraine, just like you. And she opened up to him, so happy and so relieved, so consoled by this friendship. And being a priest, he heard her confession gave her counsel. And she confided in him. She trusted him. And then when she entered the courtroom and gazed upon her judges, there he was. There he was in the front row, closest to the most evil 
and most corrupt of her judges. And she said, now I know. Now I know what hell is like. Now I understand what hell is all about, because there is no truth in hell. Now I see. I have been tricked. And now I understand there is no truth in this courtroom. It is hell. And I am in it right now. May God accelerate my martyrdom to relieve me, deliver me from this hell of injustice and untruth which dominates this courtroom of, of prelates of the church. Now I know what hell is like. There is no truth in hell. No basis, no reason for charity. This great little saint, this great model for all of us today, there are so many parallels in her story with our story today. It is worthwhile to read the lines of her account and understand that we are going through a similar event today. The corruption of justice, the corruption of truth, the corruption of sanctity, the corruption of sanctifying grace. Who could imagine? Who could imagine such a scandal? Today we are about to process after Mass. Let it be for us the symbol of our absolute fidelity to the truth and to the true Mass, the true sacraments. And let us remain unshaken. And even though we live in a world today of scandal and which increases by the day, the scandal of, of, of authority, the puppet governments throughout the world, the puppet papacies which dominate the church for over 50 years, ever since the death of Pope Pius XII, Puppet papacies, what a scandal. Who is in power? Who knows? Who wants to know? We don't want to know. We pray to Almighty God that by our fidelity we may appease his wrath. So let this procession today be for us a following of Christ, the following of the Blessed Sacrament, the true sacrament, wheresoever he shall lead us whether it be to, through tribulations and trials and sorrows and temptations and persecution, martyrdom, whatsoever may be the, the divine will of God, the holy will of God, let us say yes now. And by every step we shall take in following the Blessed Sacrament, may it be our assent, our yes, our fiat, to whatsoever God shall ask of us. And we stop at each altar of reposition and receive the blessing from the most blessed sacrament. Our Savior living amongst us, sanctifying us. Unless you eat of my body and drink my blood, you can have no part with me. Let us recall these words and today follow our Savior in this great procession, this holy procession, and to say yes with every step whatsoever shall be ahead of us in our future, knowing that we were born for this generation. We who are the sons and daughters of the saints who have suffered and died for our holy church, yes, we are the descendants, the heirs of such a great treasure of our holy Catholic faith, bought for us at such a great price. Let us give thanks in this procession. Let us renew our absolute fidelity to the true church in this procession today. And may God continue to lead us thereafter as we depart for our homes. And may God be worshipped and adored in the sanctuaries of our homes. May the Blessed Virgin Mary guide us and protect us Before we left Europe to come home, come back here, we visited the island of Bouchard. The island of Bouchard. In 1947, the Blessed Virgin Mary appeared there to warn 
the country of France, of the infiltration of communism. And she appeared to four little girls and asked, will you please pray? And they said, will you please perform a miracle to prove that this is true? She said, no. I did not come here to perform miracles. I came here to ask for your prayers. And when you pray, pray like this. And she taught the little girls how to recite the Hail Mary the proper way, slowly, reverently. How to make the sign of the cross, slowly, reverently. And how to sing. Every day, Our Lady appeared for ten days and asked the children, please, will you sing? Will you sing? Sing the Hail Mary. And Our Lady said, this is what I want you to do. If you wish to stop the infiltration, the rise of communism, which will destroy your country and the whole church, I want you to do penance. And she had the little girls, little girls of second and third grade, hold their arms outstretched and pray the rosary recite the Hail Mary as she had taught them to say with their arms outstretched. And the crowds watched in amazement little girls reciting the Holy Rosary with their arms outstretched. The entire church raised their arms in the form of a cross, their arms outstretched. The entire crowd, thousands upon thousands of faithful who came to look at these little girls who see the Blessed Virgin Mary, everyone with their arms outstretched praying the rosary in the spirit of penance. Because Our Lady asked, will you please pray? And it is in particular the prayers of the children that I'm asking for to stop communism, to stop the enemy of God, the prayers of the innocent is what I'm asking for today. And when she departed, the sun changed its rays. And that part of the church where she appeared, which was always dark, filled with light because the direction that raised the sun reversed. And that part of the church was lit up with the sunlight, the sun of justice. This little miracle that took place, unknown to most of the world, this tiny church, and the girls, two of them are still alive. And they demonstrate for the faithful. When you make the sign of the cross, when you pray the Hail Mary, when you sing the Hail Mary, when you hold your arms outstretched to pray in the spirit of penance, pray slowly and reverently. And she showed the crowd, this is how Our Lady makes the sign of the cross. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.